Hey folks. How we doing folks? Can you wave at me? Wave at me if you hear me. Can you wave at me? Hey. I don't know what was going on. It thought I was on another meeting that I wasn't on. So, hello, David. I had some other folks. We have, where's James Johnson? Are you there? And Jennifer there? Yes. Okay. My apologies for the problem. I don't know what it was. A convincing statement is the strongest arrow that any person's going to have in their quiver. Same. I'm a good person, I'm a good worker, all of those sort of things. When you talk about trying to, trying to manage someone's perception, then think about it. Think about it. And just Who else do we have here? Maybe Tiffany is a good person. Jim Nichols. Hello, Jim Nichols. Wave at me, Jim. She had a bad day. She took something and I didn't know what to do. Robin, are you there? People are trying to convince me of something. Well, back to a minute ago when I said people can talk. Robin's here. Hey, Robin. Everybody say hello to Robin. Come on, everybody, say hello to me. Somebody's talking. Hey, Robin. Okay. Let me give you another example. All right, now somebody's giving somebody an example. I'm not sure who it is. So I'm going to get ready to mute everybody in just a second. Okay. Let me get everybody's attention, okay? Okay. I'm hearing a lot of conversation in the background, but I don't want to mute yet. Okay, everybody, let me get everybody's attention, please. Hello? Hello? Everybody speak back to me. Hello? Okay, let's, uh, we need to pray over this thing because we're having people trying to get in, they're having trouble. All the way asking Jesus and that you work this stuff out for us. Help people get in, make a good connection you need to in Jesus' name, Father. Okay. All right. Well, look, I want to welcome you to the second webinar on the Courts of Heaven series. Uh, last week, we talked about some things that we're going to review in just a moment, but I want to open with a word of prayer. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. We invite your presence to be our teacher. Holy Spirit, we invite you to teach us this evening. Be our teacher. Help us gather what we need to gather, understand what we need to understand, do what we need to do. Help us in every one of these regards, Father. We're inviting your presence. Father, we're inviting your, your glory to visit with us this evening. We thank you for what you're working in us by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Now, I need everybody to wave at me or something because I'm looking at all kinds of things, but I'm not seeing people see the top of Jenny's head. And somebody's in the background, but I can't see him. Oh, hi, Preston. Okay. I can see a few faces, and you can scroll down and see other faces. And we have, who oh, James Johnson. Good to see you. And Robin, oh, hold on. Oh, that's a scary picture, I tell you, folks. Uh, Don, meet Robin. She's from Washington, D.C. Robin, can you say hello back to him? Hello back to him. <clears throat> hello, Don. Don, say hello to Robin. Hello, hello Don. James, where are you from? Well, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Okay. I've been about for 20 years. And where do you yeah. live now? I'm, I'm in Cary, North Carolina. Carry, okay. 
All right. Well, glad to have you on, James. And uh, Jennifer, are you there? You're on there by phone, I see. Okay. And Jim Nichols from Greensboro, is that the one? And Jim, is that the one? You may not be able to hear me. Sandy, you're on, aren't you? Sandy Seagal? Okay. Well, let's get started. Let me get, I'm going to mute everybody and so I can share the screen. Okay. Be just a moment. Okay, can everybody see that? Hello, Tamara. Wave at me, Tamara. Okay. Let me get this off of, I have another screen going so I can see what's going on. Okay. Last week we talked about the, uh, we introduced the Courts of Heaven subject. And uh, let me point out a couple of things in review. If you need to email me, email me at ron at courtsofheavenwebinar.com. And for those who want to support the webinar, we'd appreciate it. That's lifespring1.com. And you'll see the links for it at that website. Um, and the source for all the information about the webinar is going to be courtsofheavenwebinar.com. The uh, replays will be available there. Resources are available there. And any updates and things like that. Again, my apologies for the trouble we had getting logged into this one tonight. I'm keeping everybody waiting, but we're glad you're here. The uh, One of the websites, uh, some of the websites we have are the courtsofheavenwebinar.com and the lifespring1.com for the for this, uh Tax deductible donations, courtsofheavenbook.com, which is where you can get the book, Courts of Heaven, an introduction. And then, of course, Passion Ecclesia that we're working with on this webinar. They're helping, working in conjunction with them. Passion Ecclesia is a body of believers over in uh, Salisbury, North Carolina. Don Gray and uh, Sherry Gray are the pastors there. And uh, we'd ha love to have you join us sometime presence of the Lord has been very rich in those meetings. There are exit 74 off of Interstate 85 there in Rowan County, uh, right across, not far from the Belk uh, Coles Shopping Center. Or if you know where uh, Olive Garden is, that's it's not too far from there. Uh, last week we learned the three, basically the three paradigms of prayer friend to friend paradigm that Jesus taught in Luke chapter 11 in verse 5 through 10. And then in verses 11 through 13, he talked about the son to the father paradigm. And then he skipped over a few chapters and he began teaching about the courtroom paradigm of prayer, which he wrapped up in a parable in Luke chapter 18. Now, uh, we'll go back to that, some of that in just a moment. I wanted to review what we're going to be learning in this webinar over the next few weeks. One, what the three paradigms of prayer, what he taught, what Jesus taught, what's the mercy court, how to successfully dismantle accusations, and how to see answers to prayer quickly. And one, also, why do, do our words matter? And how to successfully operate in the mercy court. If I teach you all this stuff and you still don't know how to operate in the mercy court, I've not helped you as much as I should have, but you're going to learn how to successfully operate in the Mercy Corp before you're done with this webinar. Okay, we're going to learn a lot more than that, but by the end of this, this series, you're going to be able to successfully navigate the Mercy Corp for yourself, for your family, for your for other people, friends, churches, etc. You're going to learn the importance of the court system of heaven, and you're going to be able to intercede much more effectively than you have in the past. Because you're going to understand that this is another tool in your tool belt. What you're going to need for this course is the Courts of Heaven introduction book the, that's available at courtsofheavenbook.com. Uh, it came out just a couple months ago, and I wrote it for the express purpose of giving people an introduction to the Courts of Heaven. So for those folks who can't make the webinar that you've been telling about this, 
uh, send them to this site or get this book for them. Make a real nice Christmas present, okay? And also, you'll need something to jot some notes down and make some questions. Now you can send me, uh, send chats directly to me uh, with your questions. Uh, and we'll, as we go through, we'll try to answer those questions or work with them as best we can. Let me point out uh, some reference, uh, some resources for you. One is, the, of course, the Courts of Heaven book. I have another book called Overcoming Verdicts from the Courts of Hell. And you can go to overcomingverdicts.com for the information about that. And then a, a book by Jackie Hanselman called Silence and the Accuser. Uh, and you can see, find out about that at silenceandtheaccuser.com. Uh, Jackie and I work together on the Courts of Heaven uh, scenarios quite often. And uh, what she offers and brings to the table is extremely valuable when you're working through the Courts of Heaven. Okay? Now, the question that you and I get on a regular basis is, is the court or the courts of heaven, is that in the Bible anywhere? And I'm amazed at how many people don't think it's in the Bible at all. But when I first heard that phrase, I began to, I pulled out my quick, uh, my eSword program and I did a, you know, one of those computerized Bible th programs and I began to do a search for court related terms that I might find in the Bible. Terms like uh, petition, judge, court, witnesses, etc. Uh, and as I went through that list, I found over 1,700 passages, verses that dealt with those just those terms that I did on that initial search. Now I don't know about you, but I think of 1,700 verses is quite a lot of verses. Later on, I found some more words that I needed to add to my search list. And so my number of verses increased to over 3,500 Bible verses that deal in some measure with the courts of heaven. So if you're looking for the courts of heaven, you can find it in the Bible if you'll honestly seek for it. We often forget that the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, or in some cases sometimes called the Torah, are the are the books of the law that God set in place. And they're the basis for a lot of the courts of heaven work that we do. You also have the book of Judges. Where do you find Judges except in a courtroom? We have First and Second Chronicles that outlines different decisions of kings and judges. And many times kings acted as judges. So we have the courts of heaven showing up in, in those books as well as in First and Second Kings. In the book of Job, it starts off with uh, the courts of heaven scenario. It's not joining, it's zoom.us. Pardon me, I had a side question. Okay. But we also have in the book of Psalms, the first 50 Psalms are basically David's defenses in the courts of heaven. You also have stories in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, and other books dealing with the courts of heaven. Many times what's happened is we've not, we've read past it, not read it. We've often skipped over what we didn't understand and, and just moved on to the next thing. But the courts of heaven is scattered throughout the Bible. And as we begin with an open mind to say, Lord, show me this thing, show it, show it to me in the word, we'll begin to see the courts of heaven showing up over and over and over. Okay. Now, there's a principle that's involved uh, that particularly applies to the courts of heaven paradigm of prayer, and that is the principle of a parable. You qualify yourself for the benefits that are in a particular revelation when you dig out the truth of that revelation. For example, Jesus, when he spoke parables, he said, I'm speaking these things, uh, but I know certain of you will not understand it. He didn't want everybody to understand it. Not everybody will benefit from the revelation that you receive. Not everybody wants the revelation, and not everybody wants the changes that are involved or required by that revelation. So as we dig, dig out in the Word and we dig these revelations out, we qualify ourselves for the benefit by the, by the virtue of the fact that we did the digging. Uh, Bill Johnson put it this way. He said, the reason that gold is hidden in rocks is that only the diligent will seek it out. 
The courtroom paradigm of prayer was hidden in a parable. In Luke 18, Jesus said, and he taught them a parable on prayer, saying there was in the city uh, a widow who went before a judge. So he starts out the very first verse. Uh, he taught them a parable on prayer. He was telling us something there that we're going to have to dig out some of this stuff. It's not just going to be laying on the top of the ground waiting for, for us to scoop it up. We're going to have to look for it and dig it out, dig out the truth of these things. Um, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, there's a verse that we're very familiar with that says, Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace, that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. As we, uh, we've all come to the, the Lord and we've used that verse uh, to say to, for the Lord to answer our prayers, but we often didn't understand it. When we're coming to the throne. We're coming before the throne of a king and a judge. Uh, in the Old Testament, the judges, the kings often served, also served as judges. And judges, in some cases, became kings. So, we're looking at, he says, to come boldly before the throne of grace that we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And that's where I used it. I, I get the term for the mercy court because in this particular mercy court, we're doing like the widow woman who requested that she would find justice from her adversary. Now, every one of us have adversaries, and we need to understand how to deal with the accusations that the adversary is bringing to us so that we can overcome the adversary in every occasion, so that we can overcome every enemy that we have facing us, and we can dismantle these accusations that have been hounding us many times our entire life. And as we can disable those accusations, we can find victory in a level that we've never experienced before. Um, in Zechariah chapter 3, there's a verse that says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you'll walk in my ways, and if you keep my commands, then you'll judge my house, and you will have charge of my courts. And I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Now notice in that verse that it speaks of judging, and it also speaks of the word courts, as in plural. There are more than there is more than one court in the court system of heaven, okay. And as we go through this study, you'll find out more about some of those other courts. We're going to be dealing with what I refer to as the mercy court, and that's the subject, the primary subject of the the book that I, uh, the introduction book that I wrote. And as we understand that there are other courts, the Lord wants us to learn one that there is a court system of heaven. And he wants us to learn how to navigate in those courts so that we can bring freedom to people and to nations on the level, uh, on levels that we've never been able to do before. Okay? So as we uh, go through these things, as we seek out these different understandings, uh, understand that here's what the Lord wants you to do. He wants you to walk in his ways, keep his commands, then you'll be qualified to judge his house and have charge of his courts. And he'll give you places to walk among those who stand here. And the, and the context of that passage was earlier in chapter 3, Joshua the high priest was standing before the Lord in a court setting, and Satan came and accused him of having a dirty robe. And Joshua, being the high priest, understood that he could not serve as a high priest with dirty garments. So the Lord said, to in the presence of Satan, he said, "Put a new robe on uh, on the on him, and put a new turban on his head." And by doing so, he immediately requalified him for being able to be the high priest. As he was the high priest, as he was able to fulfill those functions, then he could step in and fulfill the destiny that God had for him as a high priest. Okay. So understand that there is one. There's a more than one court, and that He wants us to grow up in our walk with God, so that we can walk in His ways, keep His commandments, and become judges in the court systems of heaven, and some of these other courts that we'll learn about later on. As we learn to have charge of His courts, He'll give us places to walk among those who stand here, and the ones who are standing here were the angels. Uh, and were the Lord himself, 
and the cloud of witnesses because Zechariah, in this case, he was witnessing what was happening to Joshua the high priest. Now there's another scripture in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, he says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, his wheels a burning fire. A throne stream, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Then the court was seated, and the books were opened. Now notice in this particular passage that thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days were seated. Now, what does a judge's seat look like in our, in our typical throne uh, courtroom settings now in today's time? They look like a throne. They're designed to look like a very imposing uh, chair, and they were basically the, our version of a throne. Okay? And it says, uh, the Ancient of Days, when he was seated, the court was seated. As you know, when you go into a court setting, Typically, the uh, bailiff will call everyone to rise while the judge comes into the chamber. And once the judge is seated, everyone can be seated at, at that point. The same, guess where they got that idea? Daniel chapter 7 gives you an idea. They learned it from the Bible. It says the court was seated and the books were open. The books that contain our destiny, uh, our, the scrolls that the Lord has written about our lives, those were the kind of books that are books for nations, books for churches, books for ministries, books for families. These are the kind of books that can be opened. Remember, it tells about Jesus uh, in the last chapter of John, that John wrote and said that if all the deeds that Jesus had done were written, the world couldn't contain the books that had been, would have to be written. And see, Jesus only did what was written, that what he saw his father do or heard his father say. And as he walked before the Lord that way, the only things he did were the things that were coming out of his books. Okay, but that's a whole other subject that we'll talk about at another time. Okay? Now, we need to understand that the spiritual arena, the spirit world, operates on legal principles. We have to understand that it operates on legal principles and that it has, it has rules that it has to follow. We also need to understand that our prayers have to have legal footing in order to be answered. We also need to understand that as James chapter 4, verse 3 says, we can ask amiss, we can ask for the wrong motivations for certain things to happen, for certain things to be done in our lives. And he says here, you ask and don't receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now, we also need to understand that if our prayer is not answered, there, has, there must be some legitimate legal reason why it's not being answered. And of as we go through the understand the court system of heaven, we'll understand how to deal with what those legal reasons are. So that we're able to fulfill uh, what we need to do on our end to see our prayers answered. Okay. Now, uh, last week I also asked you a few questions that I'm going to ask you again. Do you have some prayers that have not been answered even after much persistence in prayer? If that's the case, wave at me, okay? Because I can see some of your faces. So if you've had some prayers that have not been answered even after a long time, just wave at me again, okay? All right, I'm scanning through some of these pictures to see what I see. Now, have you experienced frustration over having prayers that were unanswered? Now, if you've prayed any amount of time, you've undoubtedly the answer is going to be yes in this regard. Uh, have you ever wanted to give up because of an unanswered prayer? Most of us can say yes to that. And for the intercessors among us and those who have done spiritual warfare, have you done spiritual warfare only to suffer backlash or retribution? Because when we experience backlash or retribution, that's kind of a dampener on our wanting to do spiritual warfare the next time. So the next question was, have we drawn back from spiritual warfare because of those repercussions? And most people that have done spiritual warfare and have experienced a lot of repercussions, they've had a tendency to draw back from their intercessory work, their spiritual warfare work. 
Now, we're going to learn in the court system of heaven that if we'll do our courtroom work right, we won't have to do nearly as many battles as we've done in the past. We won't have to be nearly as involved and concerned with going to war like we typically thought of going to war, spiritual warfare, when we learn how to operate in the court system of heaven. And the better we learn how to operate in the court system of heaven, the more effective we will be, uh, pardon me about that, about getting our, our needs met and our prayers answered. Now, in chapter 3, which is where we're going to be picking up tonight, because last week we went over to chapter 1 and chapter 2, and if you've got the book, uh, and it's available on Kindle if you want to get a Kindle version. I like to mark in my books, and it's a little harder to do with Kindle. Uh, you can study the first couple of chapters, which was introduced in the courts of heaven and the different paradigms of prayer that Jesus talked about that we just did a review over. The, uh, the chapter is entitled, The Problem with Del Delay. And I'm speaking here concerning prayers that are uh, delayed in seeing the answer come. Um, Proverbs 13, verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when a desire comes, it's a tree of life. How many have had a prayer answered after a long time, and it was refreshing to you to have that prayer answered? Anybody who's prayed any amount of time has had a prayer uh, like the, that, that they just received a lot, great deal of joy saying, thank you, Lord, it finally came to pass. Praise the Lord, it's, that's done. Uh, James, thank you for raising your hand. And there is a raise your hand feature somewhere in there. So if you want to raise your hand and respond to me, it helps me to have feedback, Okay. Because right now I'm looking at a computer screen with a few pictures, okay, because I don't have strong enough internet to see a whole lot of pictures at one time, okay? Uh, so I can see a few of you, but I can't see a whole lot of you, okay? So wave at me and raise your hand and all that kind of thing. And there's a little sticky thing that you can click on to raise your hand also, okay? Thank you, Jim. You found it too. Uh, I'm not sure where it is. I haven't reviewed it, Okay. So just keep raising your hand. I appreciate it. Now, in Galatians chapter 6, how many like due season? As a friend of mine says, due season sucks. Well, due season is sometimes a very long way off. He said in Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Be not weary in well-doing, doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. How many remember the old uh, water pumps uh, my, my grandmother used to have an old well, and she didn't have running water. Well, her version of running water is you, run, you ran out and got it. But she had one of those pumps that you had to pump the handle, and you had to keep pumping until the water came out of the spigot uh, on the top of that pump. If you were pumping, and you pumped and pumped and pumped, and no water came out, and you quit, you would have to start all over again the next time uh, to get the water to come forth. You had to keep pumping until the water came, started flowing. And once it started flowing, it would keep flowing fairly easily. But it wouldn't keep flowing if you quit too soon. Matter of fact, it would just, uh, it may be just inches away and you quit and you walk away from it. Well, that water just re returns back down in the well. Many times our prayer life has been like that where we kept pumping and pumping and pumping. And we, in this verse, he's telling us, don't give up, keep on pumping until you get the answer, okay? Many times we give up just before the answer comes. Now, Jesus knew that was going to be a problem for the people he was speaking to because in Luke chapter 18, guess what? That's just before, right after Luke chapter 17. And in Luke 17, and then in the following chapters, he's talking about the, what is known as the Olivet Discourse how the disciples of that time, they were going to go through some really tough times in the next few years. The next generation, that particular generation, was going to experience a great deal of hardship uh, culminating in the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem. And they were going to need prayers that were answered quickly, not prayers that were answered eventually. Uh, you can't wait 30 years to have a prayer answered on certain situations. You, sometimes you need it right now within the next few moments, next few hours, or at least in the next few days. Uh, we all know people who had their uh, had trouble getting their light bill paid, and they, they started praying real hard then. And they needed it paid then. They didn't need it paid two weeks down the road, okay? 
Jesus so, name. now, Luke chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus says, He spoke a parable to them, the men ought always to pray and not lose heart. Now, the whole purpose of this particular paradigm of prayer is that we will, one, we will, we will pray in order to fulfill a legal obligation because the word ought, it comes from a Greek word that means uh, deo, that means to do something in order to fulfill a legal requirement. And he did not want them, when they were praying, to lose heart. He wanted them to be able to maintain their, their level of faith so that they saw the need met, and they were able to uh, come into agreement and see that agreement uh, completely fulfilled so that they were able to see the answer come. Now, every one of us, when we pray, we want to see the answer come. All right? So we need to understand that, one, we have to do, we, when we pray, we're doing it to fulfill a legal obligation. In, order, in other words, if you don't do the, what is legally required, you're not going to see the answer come. All right? So prayer meets a legal obligation. The courtroom scenario prayer is the only prayer paradigm that guarantees a rapid response from our Heavenly Father, the just judge. Now you think about it. In Luke chapter 11, when he was talking about the friend-to-friend paradigm, that's in the passage where he talks about uh, he can ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, and knock and keep on knocking. Okay, now that indicates to me that that doesn't tell you that it's going to happen real quickly. It may involve some persistence, because that's one of the the uh, lessons in that particular parable of prayer or paradigm of prayer is persistence. Uh, when it comes to the Lord's Prayer, it says to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. It will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, but nothing in that prayer or in that scenario indicates, uh, necessarily indicates a rapid response. The courtroom scenario, again, is the only one that uh, guarantees a rapid response. Now, let, and let's, we'll take a look at the verses that tell you that. So when the legal reasons are dealt with that hinder your answers, your prayers rather, your answers to that prayer will come, okay? So when the legal ra- reasons are dealt with that hinder the answer to your prayers, the answers will come. Your prayers will get answered. Now let's look. Let's take a look at verse uh, 6 through 8 in Luke chapter 18. And if you've got your Bible, open to that passage and take a look at it with me. Now it says, Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. Now notice this. The Lord is telling us to listen what, to what an unjust judge said. And it says, And shall not God, and shall God not avenge his own elect and cry out to him day and night? Uh, though he bear long with him. In verse 8, he says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Okay? And then nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Okay? So we have here the Lord telling us to pay attention to what the unjust judge said because we find in the verses just prior to that, the unjust judge says, I'm going to answer what this woman, uh, I'm going to give this woman what she desires because otherwise she's just going to keep on coming back and she's going to pester me until I do. Now, God doesn't have to be pestered, but the principle is he wants us to be willing to come because we know we have a right to have our prayer answered. We know we have a right to have the, uh, the adversary dealt with in our lives. And we have a right uh, as a child of God to have the benefits of being a child of God. Okay? So it says, verse 7 again, Shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bear along with him, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. God wants to answer your prayers speedily. Okay? Now, let's move ahead just a moment. Uh, in the friend-to-friend, again, you have an ask and keep on asking uh, idea. In the son-to-the-father paradigm, you ha- there's no time frame that's indicated. And in the courtroom paradigm, speedy response. 
I don't know about you, but I like speedy response to the uh, to my prayers. Okay. Uh, I have a testimony here of a friend of ours called Pat. Her name is Patsy. So she said we went to the courts of heaven on behalf of her daughter. A situation that had gone unresolved for th over three years was resolved within 24 hours of going to the courts. Praise the Lord. Now, anybody else got a situation you'd like to see the Lord answer pretty quickly? Now, my wife, Adina, and myself, we've gone through the same, we've experienced the same thing. And Adina is here. You just see the side of my head on the, if you see my picture on anything, okay? She's waving to you. She didn't want us to show the picture on her, okay? So you can see the profile view. She's not going to use the internet. Well, she doesn't realize we're already using it. Okay. So, well, we had a situation also with with our daughter uh, that had gone uh, gone on for about three years. We saw it resolved. Uh, begin to, the resolution came in about four to five days. Okay. That's good news to, to those who have prayers that have been going on for a long time, for long, uh, long standing situations. Uh, Brenda, who was with us last week, I'm not sure if she's on this, this evening. She's got a situation that is ideal for the courts of heaven to deal with. And hopefully she'll be able to stick with us and we'll be able to show her how to get that taken care of in behalf of her daughter. Okay. Now in this, in this passage, we have Jesus rebuking, the, in another passage rather, Jesus is rebuking the scribes and Pharisees for devouring widows' houses of taking advantage of the widows that were among them. Uh, prior to the early church, widows and orphans were basically discarded aspects of society. It wasn't until the early church, uh, and when Jesus came on the scene and then when he initiated the, the, the church in the book of Acts, we find that the widows and orphans were beginning to be taken care of. Even uh, the Roman government began to change policies and uh, procedures related to widows and orphans because of the example they saw the early church was setting. Okay? But prior to that point, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were just as guilty of, uh, as, it, as he called it, devouring widows' houses, of taking advantage of them. Because once in that culture, once a a woman became a widow. She basically became a non-person. The property that her husband had, uh, they could give that to some to her brothers or somebody else in her family. Just because she had been part of the, the family at one point, she no longer was really considered a part of the family. Uh, the same with the kids. If if dad had died too uh, prematurely uh, and things weren't set, uh, they could lose everything that they had. So here it is in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and you make a pretense, uh, by pretense, make long prayers. Therefore, you're going to receive a greater condemnation. Uh, religious folks don't mind making long prayers, but the heart of re you'll find out what the heart of religious folks is when it comes to how do they deal with widows, orphans, and those who can't uh, take care of things for themselves, okay? In Mark chapter 12, verse 40, he said, you are widows' houses, and by pretense make long prayers. These are going to receive a greater condemnation. So the scribes and Pharisees were not in a good situation here. They'd been devouring widows' houses, and Jesus was not in favor of that. Now, imagine that in, during this time frame, it could have been that the, the widow in Luke 18 was experiencing the, something going on with the scribes and Pharisees. We don't know. But because she was a non-person in their social system, uh, she was being harassed by somebody. And she knew that she had right to some restitution and to some, uh, some mercy in her behalf. And the court system was obligated to provide that for her. Again, we have another passage in Luke chapter 20, verse 47. You devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These are going to receive greater condemnation. Jesus apparently had a message for these scribes and Pharisees because it's repeated three times in these in the Gospels. And whenever he repeats something like that, he's wanting you to get the message. Okay. Now, one of the principles we need to understand is that even the lowliest among us have rights. And if they cannot stand up for themselves, then we should step up to the plate and assist them 
in obtaining justice, okay? He's speaking to every one of us with that. Even the lowliest among us have rights. And if they cannot stand up for themselves, then we should step up to the plate and assist them in obtaining justice, okay? Those who are uh, disabled and regardless of the, the type of disability, those with uh, Alzheimer's I mean, and or the elderly, those with aut autism and those types of issues, we need to be standing up for them. We need to be helping them because they can't necessarily help themselves. And we need to be uh, doing our part, helping them to obtain justice. And the court system of heaven is a great way to get that done. Okay. Now, the widow's request in Luke 18 was very simple. She said, get me justice from my adversary. Every one of us has an adversary. And the adversary, what he's doing is he's accusing us of things in order to divert us from our purpose. If he can divert us from our purpose, he can get us off track with the purposes of God for our life. He can get us doing things that we do not need to be doing, things that waste our time. And this widow woman understood that she needed justice. She needed a remedy for her situation. Our, when, it, when it all boils down to it, all of us have the same kind of request. We want justice from our adversary. And that was her request. That is our request. And that's where the mercy court of heaven can help us see that. We need to understand that the widow was not seeking revenge. You don't see anything in the passage indicating that she was seeking revenge. It says, do me justice against or vindicate me from my adversary. That's one of the uh, translations of that. Uh, Adam Clark, in his commentary, that's where he says, do me justice against or vindicate me from my adversary. She was not seeking revenge. Remember that. She wasn't seeking revenge. She did not have an ax to grind in that regard. She just simply wanted justice. Okay? Because one of the things we have to remember if we're seeking revenge, chances are we're offended. An offense is one of those things that can hinder us from seeing our prayers answered, from having our needs met. Okay? So we need to make sure that we're not in an offense position where we are offended, living by offense, or living under offense. Jesus said that when you pray, if you don't forgive, your Heavenly Father can't forgive you. So we need to understand that we have to deal with our offenses and let them go. Uh, I didn't. I don't think I mentioned this last week, but I often teach that there are three basic types of offense we need to, deal, to look at. One is there's the intentional offense. Were you intended to do something against somebody in order to offend them? Most people aren't guilty of that. Okay? There's the, also the unintentional offense where something happens and an offense was taken, but you didn't mean to offend them. They just took offense at whatever it was that happened. And then the third one is the one that a lot of people live in, more people live in it than realize, and that is the imaginary offense, where nothing happened, but they think it happened. And so they come up with all kinds of excuses in order to be offended at you. Uh, some of you heard me tell that we've had somebody offended at us because we weren't offended at something. Uh, and it's kind of crazy how offense will work to make you twist your thinking like that. Uh, but I have a right to be offended or not be offended. I can choose to be offended or not be offended. I don't really have a right to be offended, not that. But I can choose to be offended or not offended. Okay? I'm going to choose to live and walk offense-free. Uh, if you want some more understanding on that, get John Bevere's book, Bait of Satan. He deals with the subject of offense uh, very well. And uh, he'll help unveil some things concerning offense and how it can stop you and hinder your prayers getting answered. Okay. Now, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, the prophet Isaiah had given explicit instructions to magistrates and those in leadership. And it says in verse 17, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. See, he's giving instructions to magistrates and those in leadership, which is us. We need to learn to do good. We need to seek justice, learn how to rebuke the oppressor. And when you learn how to deal with the adversary and the accusations properly, 
you'll understand that you're rebuking the oppressor. And you, we need to learn to defend the fatherless. And we need to learn how to plead for the widow. If we will learn how to do these types of things, we will see results uh, and see the kingdom of God advanced in the earth in ways that we've never uh, before seen. In Jeremiah 22, verse 3, he says, Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness. Deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do no wrong or violence to the stranger the fatherless, or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. If you'll notice the, what the widow woman said in Luke chapter 18, give me justice from my adversary. Uh, when, you're, when you look at a passage in the New Testament, you need to look also where is that passage or something similar to it being said in the Old Testament. What else is it being brought out in the Word? In Luke, Jeremiah 22, 3 is one of those passages, as well as the Isaiah 7, uh, as we just read, is when you see this message about executing judgment and righteousness being delivered from an oppressor, and he was speaking to a widow. So she understood that this passage was speaking in her behalf, that she could get judgment, uh, justice from her, the judges, from the magistrates, and she could see relief come from the adversary. That verse, Luke 18, then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bear long with him, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? God is going to certainly avenge his children, and he's going to do so speedily. So we don't have to worry about the issue of delay like we did with some of the other uh, paradigms of prayer, where we prayed and we never saw the result. Very simply, it's like when you're building a house, you need the right tools in order to do the particular job that you're doing that day on that house. If you're building the foundation, you need a different set of tools than when you're doing the framework on the house. And, or when you're putting in the kitchen counters and the kitchen sinks, you need a whole different set of tools. You need to have the right tool for the right job. Now, another principle is that the courtroom paradigm of prayer, again, we've talked about this before, it's the only paradigm of prayer that guarantees a speedy response, okay? I bring that out over and over because I want you to get it, okay? Now, next week, we're going to talk about rightly dividing the word, okay? Because we've gone just about an hour, 45 minutes or so tonight, and I don't want to stuff you so full that you, you feel like you've gotten too much information. Okay, uh, sometimes when we're teaching, I give so much word that it's almost like the people walk out like gerbils with a lot of uh, a lot of food in their mouth, and they don't know uh, what else to do. They're just stuffed. Okay, so next week we're going to talk about rightly dividing the word and some other things. I'm going to have some testimonies and questions in just a moment. Okay, but uh, I want to point out that if you go to Quick Guide. Dot over, I mean, quickguide.courtsofheavenwebinar.com. You'll find a Mercy Court Quick Guide that you can download that'll help you get familiar with the process of going through the Mercy Court, and you can begin to think about some scenarios that you've got in your own life that you would like dealt with, and so that you can see your prayers answered and things dealt with properly and effect, efficiently and effectively in your own life, okay? So that is, again, that's Quick Guide. Courtsofheavenwebinar.com. Okay, the resources for this webinar will be on that particular website. Okay, Courtsofheavenwebinar.com. Is somebody playing with the uh, magic marker there? Okay, I see that. Uh, didn't know it would show up on everybody's. It shows up on mine. I don't know if it's showing up on everybody else's. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know who that was. It might have been my wife. I never know. It wasn't my wife. She confesses she didn't do it. Okay. Now, I'm going to unmute everybody for just a moment, okay, because I want to get some comments or some thoughts with what we talked about tonight, okay? Now, remember, when I unmute you, please don't be talking in the phone on, in the background to somebody else, because we can all hear you, okay? And it gets really confusing, uh, and it's hard to hear the one who is speaking, okay? So let me unmute everybody now, and if you, again, if you have any comments or questions along this particular line, 
Uh, let's talk about them right now, okay? Everybody is unmuted right. right now. Okay. I'm sorry, you got the wrong number. Okay, somebody's on their phone. Sure. Right. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you what. Okay. Hey. James, go ahead. Um, how, how do you get into the course of heaven? Okay. Um, remember the the quick guide. That's going to give you a track that you can run on. We'll talk about it very simply. I go before, I say, Father, I come before your courts today. And I remember in a court, and we're going to talk about this in a, in a few weeks. Every In a courtroom, you've got what? You've got a judge. You've got a defense attorney. You've got a prosecuting attorney. You've got witnesses. Uh, you've got bailiffs. You've got somebody, a court reporter. We have all those types of things in the courts of heaven. For example, we have angels who serve as bailiffs. We have uh, scribes that serve as court reporters. They're writing down what's going on. Okay? And I go before the courts. I say, Father, I come into your courts today. And I ask that um, with my attorney, my defense attorney, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit helping me uh, also as my defense attorney, because John chapter 14 refers to him as our uh, the word comforter. It actually is a word that deals with a defense attorney or a legal advocate. Okay. Father, I come before your courts this day. I ask that court be seated, that I can deal with these accusations. And I ask that the uh, great cloud of witnesses join us today, those that have testimony in my behalf. Uh, the seven spirits of God, I invite them because the seven spirits of God have insight, insight that we can learn from, that we, we can gain from as we're dealing with the courts of heaven. In Isaiah chapter 12, I believe it is, it talks about the seven spirits of God. There's the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of counsel and wisdom and might and of knowledge and understanding and the fear of the Lord. And those are not the Holy Spirit. Those are seven distinct entities uh, that are spirits, but they're not the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's one that is a spirit of wisdom, and he deals with issues regarding wisdom. All these things are a whole different teaching that need to be done at another time, okay? But, for example, if I'm in a courtroom setting and I need some understanding, I'll ask Holy Spirit, uh, spirit of understanding, help me see what I need to see here, okay? So, James, those are some of the ways. We also ask invite the, uh, the accuser of the brethren to be silent. But also we put the instruction that he can only speak when spoken to. Okay? So that he does not dis is not disruptive. Okay? We've all seen uh, courtroom scenarios on TV, and sometimes people get out of hand and get unruly and things like that. We're not permitting that in the courts of heaven. The, the Lord's not going to permit that. We're not going to permit it on our side. Okay? So, are you still with me, James? I don't see your yeah. face. I just yeah. see your, I see your desk or something. Okay. Uh, so that quick guide will help you see that uh, for the mercy court. Okay. So, and if you go to courtsofheavenwebinar.com, all those resources that we'll have will be on that website. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a menu pop up at the top of the screen. You don't see the menu when you first go on it because it, you have to scroll down a little bit for it to show up. Okay. So yeah. does that help you a little bit, James? We're, yes, thank you. You're asking for the Reader's Digest version of the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. uh, anybody else with a question? Robin, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Robin, can you, do you have a testimony that you'd like to share about the courts of heaven? Uh, not right now. Can, how about next week? Okay. All right. Uh, Jenny, what's going on with your Courts of Heaven stuff? Um, well, like I had said in the last one, I had done a quick court session about my work, and things have improved greatly. Um, I had mentioned I have an eBay store, and things have been really picking up there selling, so I'm real thankful for that. Okay. And I got my first bonus at my job, and I'm supposed to be getting a monthly bonus there, so... And all that is a result of a, going to the courts, is that correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, all right. Anybody here, anybody else want to raise? <laughs> anybody, anybody want to raise? Robin, you want to raise? I'll raise. 
Okay, Barbara, Barbara Clark, you were with us last week, right? And you had the question about your daughter. Is that correct? Can you hear me, Barbara? Okay. He's talking to you. I'm talking to you, Barbara. Hey, Barbara. Wave at us, Barbara. I'm looking for you. Okay. Sherry, are you available? Can you give a testimony in the courts of heaven? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can't I see you, but we can hear you. My mic wasn't on, but you don't want to see me. <laughs> I've got to credit. Um, I've just had multiple, multiple things that I've taken to the courts. I mean, I've took family. I've took job situations. I've took money situations. Um, but I guess the biggest thing um, is when I went to the courts over my bloodline over my generations, um, I can tell you things shook off us that had held us down for years and years. Okay. Um, you know, we don't live paycheck to paycheck anymore like we used to. Um, I think that was a big generational curse um, from both sides of my family. Uh, they weren't very rich. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not rich by no means, but, you know, I believe it will be. I believe that God is making a way um, because that is one of the major things that has changed in the past just year. Mm -hmm. um, and then with my family, uh, just recently, um, I had my niece restored back to me and I hadn't seen her in 30 years. And mm -hmm. I had taken her, I had taken that situation to the courts less than a month ago. Okay. And within, and she contacted me out of the blue, like just a couple of weeks later, and I hadn't seen her in thirty years. Okay. Anybody with a thirty-year-long oh. prayer request, seeing oh. her in two weeks, that's pretty nice. Jackie, are you available? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. You, now you and I, we have lots of testimonies in the courts of heaven. Okay. But, yeah, you, you can step right in and follow up with what Sherry just shared about the generational stuff uh, and bloodlines and stuff like that. And this is Jackie who wrote the book Silence and the Accuser that I mentioned earlier in the mm -hmm. webinar. Okay, so Jackie, introduce yourself real quickly and just share, pick a testimony. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Jackie Hanselman and Ron and I have been good friends for over two years. It's been going two and a half years at this point. But this whole process of going into the courts and dealing with the issues, it's really iniquitous patterns that have held our families in captivity when you're dealing with bloodlines. And I have seen such amazing shifts, but it really requires having the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, for the Lord to give you the insight into what you're really dealing with. So I think I'll give the testimony of when we were in Nagaland. Okay. Ron and I were there. And as we were flying into Nagaland, I was very sick. I developed an incredible sinus and, sinus and chest infection. Luckily, we had a nurse with us who put me on um, antibiotics right away, but I had to teach. This was the beginning of the teaching of a two-week school. And that first day, I was so incredibly sick. And I would teach and I'd go to bed. And everybody's praying for me and nothing is budging this thing. And so the next day, I'm again teaching, going to bed. And I'm laying there and I'm listening. I'm soaking in worship music and really crying out to the Lord saying, I know how to receive healing. What is holding this in place? And he showed me a coffin of death. So I went to Ron, I guess at dinner time, and said, Ron, we need to go to the courts over this. And I knew it was generational. And then when we went in for the generational, it dealt with a very deep-rooted spirit of religion that was over my family lineage. And we were in a land of religion, and that gave the enemy the right to um, really take me, take me out. 
so we did we did our court work that night and the next morning I felt much much better there was a, a real increase in how I felt then the next day I'm very sick again and I'm like what is going on Lord and I got the word betrayal so I went into court to report for all the betrayals in my family. And again, it was very, very deep rooted. I mean, we're talking going back. But I saw the Romans. I saw the, I saw the Colosseum. I saw the lions in the Colosseum. And I'm like, okay. And so I dealt with that. And the next day I felt good again. There was an incredible increase. Okay, next day. I'm sick again. And I'm going, Lord, I know that we're making progress. What's going on? And he told me that I had taken up the offense against the British. We can take up offense on behalf of other people, which is what I had done. And by doing that, it gave the enemy ground. So I repented from that. And from that point on, I started to heal. And what the Lord showed me in all of that is in some of our circumstances, we have what's called the entanglement of iniquity. That these iniquitous patterns are entangled together, holding us in a certain place. And we have to disentangle each, each part of it to get the healing. Okay? Okay. okay. Any questions? Well, you can open up for a whole lot of questions on that, but that'd be a whole other, another session. Yeah. Okay, but Jackie, uh, you can go to silenceandtheaccuser.com mm -hmm. and find out about the book. Uh, and cause that is her specialty, so to speak, is dealing with bloodline issues and getting those things dealt with, dealing with the iniquitous patterns so that we can uh, be relieved of the enemy's right to do things, to yeah. rob and steal. And we'll talk about that more in one of the future sessions, okay? But uh, we got a little bit of a late start, but now we've been about an hour, and I don't want to drag this out on everybody. But next week, we'll, 7 o'clock next Tuesday, and then we're going to take a break at the week after Christmas. So there will be no webinar. We'll start back in January, okay? Because everybody's going to be busy enough. Next week is going to be uh, really busy for folks as well. But we're looking forward to what uh, God's going to do in your lives as you, as you gain better understanding about the courts of heaven, and as you take an honest look at this thing and say, Holy Spirit, show me what I need to know, okay? And if you not don't have the book, please get the book. Uh, go to courtsofheavenbook.com, and you can order it there uh, and so that you can get an understanding of what we're teaching, what we're talking about. And you'll find that it's in the Word, but we've many times we've just read past it not meaning to ignore it, we just simply didn't see it. And Jesus tells us, that unless we have eyes to see, we won't see. Unless we have ears to hear, we won't hear. Okay? So we need to be, be able to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And the Holy Spirit can help us experience that. So I, I want to close with prayer. Uh, Jackie, would you mind closing us with prayer? Father, we come before you, and we are so pleased that you have opened up the reality of the courts of heaven, that you're teaching us how to co-labor with heaven, that we can sit. We are in heavenly places. We just step into heavenly places. We just step into the courts, and everything is there, and you're waiting for us, and you're excited when we come. <coughs> and Father, I want to thank you for this teaching. I want to thank you. I ask that you bless Ron and you bless each of the participants, and you open their hearts and their understanding. And I specifically ask that you show them it's so simple. It is so simple. It's just repentance of the blood of the Lord. It's so simple. So I thank you, Father. I thank you that we seal this work tonight for time and eternity. I thank you, Father, that the blessings of the Lord make it rich, and you add no sorrow or toil to it. Bless you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Now, the replay will be available at courtsofheavenwebinar.com. Scroll down and you'll see replays. And last week is on there. This one will be on there as soon as I have it available. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much for your patience and for be praying for us. Be praying for this. Be praying that the Lord will send those who need to come.
those who have hearing ears and uh, seeing eyes. Okay. And if you have questions, you can email me at ron at courtsofheavenwebinar.com and we'll uh, do our best to answer them or work in that work to see those answers for you. Okay. Bless everybody. Have a good evening. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.